All right. So good morning. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> and welcome to our second Forage Forum Friday. Um, we're incredibly excited to have you here today. If you missed last week's session, you should have gotten an email that had a link to where the recordings will be located. Um, so we've started a YouTube channel and that's where all of the recordings will be placed. Um, if you are a teacher here for credits, um, your professional growth points, I will be sending a worksheet out at the very end of the series with some questions that will need to be answered um, in order to get the credits that you, you um, the seven credits that you could get with this series. So with that, that should be most of the housekeeping at this moment. And we will hand it over to Brooke Savancic. She is our speaker today. Um, she's not only the ag educator, but also the 4-H educator down in Sullivan County. So I'm incredibly excited to have her with us today. Um, she has a great background in forages from Purdue. And so I'll let her share what she's going to be speaking about today. So take it away, Brooke. Thanks, Alicia. Let me get my screen set up here. Okay, can you see that okay? Perfect. Um, so feel free to use the chat box at any time to ask questions today. And um, I have it up where I can see it, but Alicia, if I don't get to something, um, feel free to interrupt me and we'll talk about it as it comes up. So like Alicia said, my name is Brooke Stefancic and I'm the extension educator here in Sullivan County covering both ag and 4-H. Um, I really love working with both the youth and adult populations in Sullivan County. So um, the split position is really great for me because I um, get to do two of my passions together at once. Uh, my background, I was a 10 year 4-H member and showed um, all the different livestock species uh, my favorite were probably goats, horses, and cattle. So that's kind of where my passion lies um, nowadays and how to use those animals to harvest forages effectively and how to grow forages to help the animals grow um, well. So just a full system. And I really love the combination of those um, livestock grazing systems. Let's see, there we go. So today we have three topics that I'm going to cover. Um, the first is forage species selection. So um, we have a field, we need to either renovate it or we're gonna have a new seeding. How do we decide what forage species we should select to put on that field? Um, the second part is going to be over reading a seed tag and we're gonna work on calculating some seeding rates. So um, hopefully have a calculator or at least a piece of paper to do it longhand. Um, very simple calculations, but just wanted to give you that practice today on doing that. And then the last topic we're gonna talk about is on alternative or niche forage crops. So when I think of species selection, um, it's really important to match those species with our farm and what we have available as far as land. So each species has strengths and weaknesses, um, just like people, just like animals. So we wanna use the strengths and weaknesses of each of those forage species to complement our farm. And I think diversification of those species is also very important because that just gives you more stability in um, different years where it could be hot or cold or wet or dry. You know, we know our our weather patterns recently have been a little bit more unpredictable than even what I remember, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so how can we help just protect our farm and our forages during those years um, where things may change? So I think of grazing like a team sport. So um, we have all these different species ideally that are working together. So just like football, we are not asking a quarterback to play the football game alone. So we have alignment, we have running backs, kickers, um, wide receivers, then they all work together to win the game. So when we are selecting species, if we can select 
the species to work in those different roles more specifically, then we can have a better um, grazing system by utilizing just the strengths and having a good team, team out in our field that's working for us. So the first way I start um, thinking about how can I start breaking down all these different choices for forages um, to figure out what the strengths are and maybe what I can match on my farm. So thinking about cool season grasses versus warm season grasses versus legumes. Um, cool season grasses, as you can see on the chart, are more um, grow the best in the spring and late summer. So you can see their first bump of growth. It actually should be starting here soon. I saw some fresh blades of grass in my lawn as I've gone in and out the last few days. Um, I am in Sullivan, so I'm in Southern Indiana, so I'm not sure if Alicia has seen that in her lawn yet, but um, I know my dad is probably itching to get on the tractor here as soon as he can. He has to wait a few more weeks at least, if not another month or so, but it's starting out there right now. Um, they'll kind of go to sleep in the summer, what we call the summer slump, it gets a little hot for them. Um, so they will kind of go back in their growth, not grow as much, and then bump up in the spring when those cooler air arrives in August and September. And then the warm season grasses, they start to take off in late May. Um, they have their most growth during the hot summertime when there's cool season grasses, they're trying to find the shade. Um, and then they taper off into the fall as those, when those cool season grasses are starting to get some relief, the warm season grasses are saying it's about time to go back to sleep, back into dormancy. And then finally, our forage legumes, they're more consistent across the season. So we do have a little bit more of a bump in the spring, but they don't decrease as much as what we see in those cool season grasses. So how can we use that to really help us on the farm? I think, um, if you think about when you're grazing and you know during the summer those cool season grasses are maybe going to get tired, maybe you have areas on your farm where warm season grasses are planting that you move those animals to to start grazing to give those cool season pastures a rest and really utilize the diversity between the cool season and warm season grasses to your advantage. So here's just um, comparing those, what are the main differences? Cool season grasses are really what we see mainly across Indiana. They're our main pasture and hay species. They include things like orchard grass, tall fescue, timothy. Um, they have a higher nutritive value, the cool season grasses do, and also a longer window of productive productivity. So we saw, you know, those two bumps on the graph of growth versus the warm season grass just had that one um, shorter bump of growth during the summer. Um, the warm season grasses are higher yielding, but what we give up is the nutritive value. So as they really start to get tall, um, their nutritive value starts to decrease because we're getting a lot more fiber um, increasing as those plants mature. Um, and so with the warm season grasses, another important thing is just to make sure we're selecting varieties that are adapted to our area. Um, so switchgrass, for instance, is a grass that's found native across all of the United States, but we would not want to plant a variety that does well um, in Texas here in Indiana. So there are a lot of different options. Um, big blue stem, gamma grass, Indian grass, switchgrass, a lot of good options for warm season grasses. Um, and that will do pretty well at overwintering here in Indiana. So a little note on legumes. Um, I just wanted to go over the physiology of um, how that nitrogen fixation works a little bit. It's a really cool process. I really um, loved learning about legumes and that process. And um, I see some annotations, Alicia. I'm gonna try to, I'm sure it's by accident. There we go. <laughs> um, so, Legumes mean that they are nitrogen fixing. And I, I think I forget sometimes that maybe that's not as common. I was talking to someone on the phone the other day that called in and my, I said legume and he looked, he was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so legumes are nitrogen fixing. They utilize nitrogen from the air 
um, in a symbiotic relationship and that forms nitrogen fertilizer for themselves and the kind of plants around them. So um, the symbiotic relationship is a bacteria in the soil called rhizobium. And so you really need the correct soil pH to have healthy rhizobium population in the soil. So that's why it's really important to get a soil test um, before you decide to plant because um, if we have legumes out there and a, um, a more acidic soil than what they like, then we're not creating that nitrogen, which is the whole reason to grow those legumes in the first place. Um, and then a final note for legumes, if we haven't grown them in a while, so say we're planting alfalfa or red clover or bird's foot trefoil back into a um, field that's been in corn for a while, it would be um, good to consider um, to inoculate and you can either buy a bag and we'll see in a little bit, it's also sometimes included in the coating of that seed. Any questions so far? Okay, so the place that I start when I have someone call in or when I'm looking at what, how am I going to select what species to put um, on my farm, I start with looking just at the soil and the different soil types that are there. Um, so these species are adapted to different types of soils and specifically for the drainage. Um, so I have this list here and I like this and I think we'll be giving out the slides, right, Alicia? To, okay. So um, I put all this on here basically as a quick reference guide. Um, it's also the forage field guide has this listed um, under each species this way as well. And so in poorly drained soils, our options are fairly limited. Alcyke and white clover do okay. Reed canary grass is one that can tolerate poorly drained soils. However, it is um, considered invasive in Indiana. So we just have to be careful um, with all those um, seeds, they can get into waterways and really spread fast um, out there in the field. For somewhat poorly drained soil, we have a lot of options and these can kind of rotate between somewhat poorly drained and moderately well drained. But if we have a droughty year, they probably would not do well in a well drained soil um, just because of they, they like to have a little bit of wet feet, I guess you would say. Um, and under that, bird's foot trefoil, the um, cool thing about that is it's non-bloating for livestock, um, but it can be harder to manage in the pasture because it does not like to be overgrazed. Um, most species do not like to be overgrazed, but bird's foot is specifically um, more sensitive to that, I guess. Um, hairy vetch, red clover, soybean, and sweet clover, um, here, red clover is usually the, the most popular one um, that it's used here in Indiana. Um, for our grass selection, we have um, Kentucky bluegrass, orchard grass, perennial ryegrass, and annual ryegrass, and then smooth brome grass, tall fescue, and timothy, as well as switchgrass can do okay in poorly drained soil as well. Um, for moderately well-drained, that's where we get into those um, warm season grasses. So um, big bluestem, eastern gamma grass, and Indian grass like to be in moderately well-drained soil, and I probably would not move them down. Um, they might be able to tolerate somewhat poorly drained, but they just will not do as well. And then the last one, alfalfa for well-drained soil. Um, you have to have well-drained soil to grow alfalfa there. You're not moving it. Um, down. I'm not sure maybe Dr. Johnson can comment if we tile the field. I'm not sure how much that would maybe save us for alfalfa, but um, just we have to have a well-drained field. And also the other consideration with alfalfa is a fragipan. So we do not want a fragipan that would restrict the root growth. That would cause what we call heaving in the winter. So that root, um, the freeze thaw action of that soil will actually push that um, alfalfa crown out of the ground and it will die. Um, Dr. Johnson's asked me to mention alcite clover um, can cause photosensitivity and liver disease in horses, so we do have to be careful um, with that in mind. I don't see any other questions coming in. 
and the previous slide was perennials. I should have mentioned that. And then as far as annuals go, we'll talk more about these in the alternative forage section at the end. Um, but we have some pretty good choices. Um, TEF can tolerate a range of drainage and it is one that has become more popular recently. Um, I've seen it, especially online, more people selling it and stuff. So I think it's really starting to become a go-to, but I think you have to be careful with how you manage it from what I've seen um, harvesting in a timely fashion to make sure you get some good quality off of it. Um, and then we have for moderately well-drained forage sorghum, foxtail millet, pearl millet, sorghum Sudan grass and Sudan grass. And we'll go over those in a little bit more detail at the end. So just overall, in addition to the soil type, what else are we gonna think about when we're selecting seeds? Um, for forages. So we need to think about what is our purpose for using those? Um, are we trying to create a high, high quality dairy um, cow feed or um, do we just need a cover crop to keep the soil covered for the winter? Are we wanting to graze it? Are we planting food plots for deer? Um, do we wanna conserve the soil? What is our purpose? Um, choosing those that are adapted to your soil type and fertility, so taking a soil test again, we wanna make sure that soil pH is right. And um, if we have a low fertility soil and we need to spend a few years bumping that fertility back up, then we may need to plant a different species um, to begin that renovation process than if we start with a high fertility soil that we don't need to apply as much fertilizer to get it back into shape. How much yield do we need? And plant back restriction is important because um, like I mentioned before, if you are converting like a corn or a soybean field back to forages, we need to know what herbicides have been sprayed. I would go back two years um, because there could be restrictions that could, we don't wanna plant that seed and then figure out that, oh, there was an herbicide applied and it killed you know, the alfalfa that I had planted or the red clover. So just to know that field history before we invest the time and money into planting. Um, resistance and tolerance to pests. Um, so each different seed variety, you can get um, how much it's resistant to the different um, diseases or pests. For example, like potato leaf hopper um, resistant alfalfa is a choice. Um, and usually on the variety, um, they have like a flyer that will tell you the information on the resistance of that seed to different um, diseases and pests. Uh, make sure it's selected to grow in our zone for winter hardiness. Um, and then if it has any additional quality traits, for example, like the brown midrib, um, that is a quality trait that makes the um, digestibility a little bit better for the animals. And finally, making sure, like we said with reed canary grass, is it invasive? Is it going to start spreading and I can't keep it under control? And how tough do I need that grass to be? Is this a high, higher traffic area where we're moving through a lot or um, a back pasture that maybe doesn't get used as much so the um, grasses won't be as fresh under as much grazing pressure? Um, yes, Alicia, I would consider alfalfa autotoxicity to fall into that kind of plant back restriction. Um, and I don't have, there's a good publication on that we could send out. Um, in general, a good rule of thumb would be to wait about a year um, before, after killing the last alfalfa um, field to replant alfalfa back into that field. Um, Okay, any more questions from anyone on species selection? Is there something that I haven't covered that um, you would have liked to see covered or do you have any questions? I'll give you a minute. You can either unmute or write it in the chat either way. No? Okay. Nope, not yet. 
Yep, that's fine. Just give everyone a second. It's Friday, so um, we will move on to reading C tags then. Um, so I just planted, I was telling Alicia um, before everyone jumped on, I just planted my um, hay field or renovated, I guess I overseeded back into the existing sod. Um, and so these are the seed tags of the um, varieties that I actually planted. So I'm not promoting these varieties. This is the first year I've grown any of them. So I can't even give you any feedback on them. All I know is this is the seed tags I had and this is exactly what I went through to decide um, what am I gonna plant out here? So one thing that I guess I didn't, I wasn't quite prepared for in school um, when I was working with Dr. Johnson, we always calculated bulk seeding rates. How much seed do you need based on the seed tag? But when I go to buy seed, I don't get that seed tag until I have already bought the seed. So it's kind of a double-edged sword of, you don't really know how much you need until you get it because that's when you see the seed tag for the first time is after you've bought it. So, um, and that'll come into play when we start doing calculations here at the end, but just something that I have learned um, in the past few years. So the first thing um, when we're going through the seed tag is just to break down and look at all the different components of it individually. So. Um, at the top here, we have the variety. Um, so this is devour, that would be the variety and orchard grass would be the species. Um, the next thing is the lot number. Um, and that may not mean too much to us right now, but if there could be a recall or, um, I don't know, maybe they find invasive seeds in one of the bags, then you can know that lets them track to know, okay, could that have been in mine too because it's the same lot. Um, origin on here, so we can see that this seed originated in New Zealand. Um, and then we move into um, what is actually in the bag. So pure seed means um, how much um, of it is orchard grass specifically, that specific variety that's stated. So in this bag, 96.49% of the weight of this bag is attributed to orchard grass. So where's that other 3% coming from? Well, there aren't any other crop seeds. So if this was a mixture, we would have the different names listed and the percentages for each. Um, so in here, this is inert matter is where that's coming from. So it could be a little bit of chaff from the seeds. Maybe it's a little bit of um, particulate. And I think the most important thing um, to look for on that list also is weed seeds. So this one has 0% of weed seeds. Um, if you do have a percentage of weeds, um, then you wanna go down to look at the next component, which is noxious weed seed. So this we can see has none, but if um, we really wanna make sure like, for example, there's not, I don't know, Canada thistle or poison hemlock or some other noxious weeds that would be in this bag. Um, I'm not sure that someone could really sell that. I think I read somewhere that it, is illegal to have noxious weed seeds, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. So just check that seed tag um, to be sure. The next thing to look at on here is the germination. So we will use um, the pure seed percentage and the germination percentage to calculate um, seeding rates in the next few slides. Um, and then finally, the date tested that lets us know when did they test the germination of the seed. If that date was several years old, then I would want to take that seed out and do my own germination test to make sure um, the seed is still good. So if I put, you know, 10 or 20 seeds and you can just put them in like a, we use Petri dishes, but I don't know, imagine whatever you could use at home, um, or maybe just a wet paper towel for a few days. Um, put it in a dark spot and see how many of those seeds germinate out of 10 or 20. You know, if you only get three or four seeds germinating out of 20, then it's probably time to buy a new seed bag and um, 
dispose of those somehow. Oh, and the net weight. So how much seed is in that bag? Any questions on any of the seed tag components? So if I do have seed that only has a 30 or 40% germination, would it hurt to include it with new seed if we're going to be running the drill anyways? Or is it just a waste of money at that point? Um, I think so if you just wanted to throw it out, as long as it's not, you don't want to take up space if it's a variety that is not very disease or insect resistant, because that would just harbor, that would give those insects or diseases a harbor in that field. But if it's improved seed, um, I'll let Dr. Johnson comment whatever he thinks, but I think if you want to throw it out there, we just have to make sure Make sure you're getting the seeding rate for sure of the good seed. And then if you want to throw that on the top after that, um, just make sure it doesn't cut back or break into the good seed that you are planting. Okay, to round this out, I wanted to do a grass and legume both today. Um, and the legume is um, a little bit more interesting. So um, here you can see um, wow, the pure seed is a lot lower than the orchard grass. So um, pure seed for this red clover, and you can see at the top it's covered in what's called nitro coat, which is a name brand coating. I don't, I didn't look into it. So um, you can look into the different coatings if you're into that. Um, but um, you know, one over the other, I don't have any necessary recommendations for if the, if it, one coating is better than the other. Um, so where, why is that pure seed so much lower than in the orchard grass? It's because of that coating material. So you can see 34% of the bag is, um, bag's weight is from that coating material. Um, this one actually does have 0.1% weed seed, um, which doesn't seem like that much, but depending on if it's really tiny and lightweight seed, it could be um, more than what it seems. But um, since it's not over like 1% or anything, I'm not as concerned. And it says it's not a noxious weed. Um, so I'll see here in a few weeks, maybe what those weed seeds were when everything starts to germinate. Um, and then we have the inert matter and the other crop seed. Um, it doesn't say on here what that is. So um, again, I'll probably figure it out when it starts growing. And um, sometimes it's just what we have to figure out, but it's not too high of a percentage. So again, I'm not really that concerned. The other thing with legumes is they usually list hard seed, which means, um, the seed will probably germinate at some point, but we can't predict when. So we never want to use that hard seed percentage when we are doing calculations. So we will use that 85% germination percentage um, for our calculations that we'll do here in a minute. Um, and so the interesting thing for me when I read this seed tag was that the coating contains the inoculant for the clover. So um, that was helpful for me to know. Um, you know, I didn't need to necessarily buy inoculant. There was red clover growing in my field before, so I wasn't concerned. But if I was doing a new seeding, then with this, um, the inoculant is already there on the seed. So now we're going to go into calculating seeding rates. Um, so in the forage field guide and in most um, extension publications, the seeding rate that you're given is based on pure live seed. Um, when I've gotten seeding recommendations from um, seed dealers or cooperatives, they usually tell me how much bulk seed they recommend. And I have found that usually those bulk rates are a little bit higher than what I would actually need to seed based on when I calculate the pure live seed. So um, if someone does give you a bulk rate of just say, hey, here's you know, your bags of seed, 
plant however much per acre. I would just go ahead and redo the math on that based on the seed keg. Because if you can save a little bit um, and maybe use it either on another field or um, save it for hopefully the next year, it would still be good, then um, you know, might as well save it if you can save you a little bit of money. Um, so to calculate pure live seed, we're gonna um, take the percent pure seed times the percent germination and then divide by 100. And then we take that number um, and use it to calculate our bulk seeding rate. And so we will go through that math now. So we're gonna look back at this orchard grass. So what we would do is take the 96.49, can you see my mouse? Okay, perfect. So we take this 96.49% of pure seed and we times it by 85% germination, whoops. And then we'll divide by 100. Um, and so then that will give us 55.7% of um, pure life seed. So then we save that number for our bulk calculation that we'll do in a minute. Okay, so I want you guys to calculate the um, pure or the, yeah, the pure life seed um, percentage for this orchard grass number. And that is 96.49% of pure seed and 85% germination. I'll type that in the chat and you guys do the math and tell me what the pure live seed percent is. Okay, we got one answer. Everyone else agree or did anyone get else? Oh, you're fine. <laughs> what did everyone else get? Do you agree? Okay, so yes, it's 82%. Good job, Jennifer. <laughs> bonus points. Alicia put down bonus points for that person. <laughs> um, okay. So then we will move on to bulk seed calculations. Um, so we know now that the red clover had a pure life seed percentage of 55.7%. Um, so to figure out our bulk seed calculations um, in the forage field guide or for um, overseeding with red clover, five pounds per acre is a common um, recommendation. And so we can take that five pounds of pure live seed that we want to have per acre. And we know that in that bag, in a pound, only 55.7% would be considered a pure live seed. So we need to divide five pounds divided by the 0.557 to get us our bulk seeding rate. So when we do five divided by um, 0.557, that gives us nine pounds of bulk seed per acre. Formula for the bulk seeding rate. Yeah, sorry, I should have. I wasn't thinking when I did that. Here is that um, formula. So the bulk seed rate is equal to the recommended pure live seed rate, which is usually in pounds per acre. And then you divide by the percent pure live seed, which you should use as a decimal. So 50% you use 0.5. I'll give you a second to write that down if you want to. Okay.
So I will let you guys again do the math for orchard grass here. Um, our target rate, we want to um, apply 10 pounds of pure live seed of orchard grass per acre. We calculated before that the pure live seed percentage in our bag is 82%. So what is our bulk seed rate? Okay, we got one answer in the chat. Anyone else? Okay, so correct. And I rounded on my calculation. Oh, I forgot to change that eight to 10. So yes, what we did, um, the answer is 12 pounds of bulk seed per acre. So then the reason we need to do these calculations is just to know, you know, how much seed do I need um, to cover over my field? So I, um, if I was planting this on my field, I have between four and five acres of hay field. And so then I would know that I would need um, between 48 and 60 pounds of seed. So I would need to buy two bags because they come in 50 pound bags. So, um, to do these calculations and it will help us um, when we calibrate the drill to know, you know, what is our expected rate? How much seed are we trying to put out on that field and um, calibrating the drill to make sure we are putting on that much. That way, when we get to the end of the field, we haven't either one ran out of seed or two, we have double the amount left. And now we have to drive over the field again and use another, you know, tank of diesel and the time that it took to drive across the field. And I'm hoping maybe Alicia will talk next week on pasture innovations a little bit about the importance of calibration and some of the equipment. Sure, sure she says. Okay, so we are gonna wrap up today by talking about alternative forages. So what are our options um, for forages outside of the classic orchard grass alfalfa or tall fescue um, that we've all, you know, seen very commonly um, for the past, you know, 50, 60 years. So as I was coming up with this presentation, I was thinking, how can I define what an alternative forage is? And I didn't really find a specific one from anywhere online. So I just kind of sat down and thought, what are the different components that come together for me to label something maybe as an alternative forage versus a, you know, traditional forage. So um, you can tell me what you think in the chat or unmute, um, but what I came up would be like a non-traditional crop, usually annuals, that are grown to extend the grazing season or, or offer an additional feed resource um, for animals. Um, so that kind of brings together, you can see the cow on the right, I think um, is grazing a Sudan or sorghum Sudan grass. Um, it is a warm season annual and it's just gave that owner operator an additional feed source for those cattle during the summer, probably when those cool season grasses are not growing very well. So then we can move them into something um, like the sorghum Sudan grass there to give our cool season pastures a rest and let them um, start regrowing for fall grazing. And so you kind of ask yourself, how can we fit different crops into our operation? We wanna keep the ground as green or you know as much cover from plants as possible. We want to cover that soil to prevent soil erosion and we also want to have a feed resource for our animals. 
whether that's going to be taken off as grazing or maybe we're going to harvest it and make silage or hay or baleage. Um, so I wanted to go through a few of these calendars and thanks Dr. Johnson for um, lending me these calendars from his presentation. Um, I really like the visual of these because it helps me as a visual learner to, you know, think about this in a timeline setting of how maybe some of these alternative crops can fit into the system. So this would be how we can fit um, a summer annual alternative forage into a um, wheat grain rotation. And so um, if we kind of start winter wheat is usually seeded in the October timeframe. It will grow um, a little bit. I just saw a comment in the chat. Let me finish this slide and then we'll go back to that. Um, so it'll grow in the fall and then it'll kind of stay a little bit dormant as the um, snow and stuff hits and then it'll really take off in the spring once it starts to warm up. It's really happy right now and growing outside, especially down here um, in Sullivan. I can imagine the winter wheat is very happy out there right now. It's warm, um, we just got some rain. Um, and so that winter wheat will be taken off, harvested as grain in the beginning of July. And then we have um, the option to plant a summer annual or something to give us some ground cover during that time where the field would be um, bare before we planted that winter wheat seed again in the fall. So, um, Fit there in that July time frame, we can plant a uh, summer annual grass, such as sorghum Sudan grass. Um, also, annual ryegrass would fit in there. Oats or turnips, or um, a combination of oats and turnips, would work well as well. And then in the September to November time frame is when we would start either grazing or harvesting those crops. Um, maybe we're putting the summer annuals into baleage or silage. Uh, maybe we're grazing the oats or turnips. Um, you know, a lot of different options there and flexibility for how you want to use that forage in your system. Next, the winter small grain calendar. Um, so this would be also, we could have corn silage production in the summer. So planting usually occurs around late April into May. Um, we would harvest that corn silage in um, September and we could um, sow the small grain seed after the corn silage came off. So um, think about wheat, rye, um, barley, any of that could be planted. You can mix in some turnips with that as well. If you have good, um, precipitation, rain in the fall, and it's growing fairly well, you could graze that grain in um, the December timeframe, as long as soil conditions are good and they're not going to be, um, you know, if it's really, really wet, we would want to be cautious on that. Um, then once we got to the April, May timeframe, we can think about grazing those again or harvesting them for silage or hay. Any questions there? Thanks, Alicia, for answering that question in the chat. No questions on the timeframes? Okay, we are gonna move into now talking more specifically at uh, different kinds of varieties of alternative forages. So starting with sorghum Sudan grass and Sudan grass, um, you can see on the right a picture of a brown midrim sorghum Sudan grass. And so, um, if we compared the midrib of this versus just a regular sorghum Sudan grass, the regular would be like a white to yellow and this is brown. So it has um, improved digestibility as compared to the normal, um, normal seed. And that is an improved trait that was introduced um, by different breeding practices. Um, so thanks to the forage breeders out there for bringing that um, to us. It's a summer annual grass that is drought tolerant and it has better regrowth. So um, think better for grazing than maybe millet or corn. The one drawback to this is that it does have prussic acid potential, um, which means that um, when a freeze hits, um, it has compounds in it that would basically give them 
um, prussic acid poisoning. And um, the good thing is that um, a graduate student at Purdue is developing a non-prussic acid experimental variety. And so um, there may be some hope in the future for being able to grow this without having that issue of prussic acid, um, which is really exciting, I think, um, just to release that worry from um, grazing that maybe later into the fall after a frost. So it is best um, either grazed or unsiled because the thick stalks would be really hard to get it dry enough for hay. Um, annual ryegrass um, is one that I think is really cool. I haven't done personally much with it, but I've heard um, some good things. So it's really a weak perennial, which means it's not gonna all die when a freeze comes, a hard freeze. Um, so seedling vigor is high and quality is good, but it is not very drought tolerant. Um, so you will probably have this reoccurring in future stands um, for several years as it won't all die in that first year with the frost. And the one of the reasons I included this is that it has been documented to break up and kind of move that fragipan down in the soil. So that's something that I think is really cool. And I'm excited to see future research coming out on annual ryegrass um, and more documentation on how it interacts with those fragipans to kind of break them up and move them in the soil. Cause I think that's really an exciting thing um, to use it for in the future. Um, pearl millet is another summer annual grass that is an option um, for grazing or in siling. Um, it can grow um, better at lower pHs than sorghums and it is more drought tolerant. Um, the great thing about the millets, both foxtail millet and pearl millet, is that it has no prussic acid potential. So with those, if we get a freeze in the fall, we don't have to worry about the millets um, causing prussic acid poisoning in those animals. The foxtail millet does have thinner stems, so it would be better adapted if we wanted to use something for a hay. Um, foxtail millet would be the choice over pearl millet for hay because its stalks um, are thinner and be easier to dry out. Um, and then teff is the one that is becoming more popular. So it's an annual grass in our environment. Actually, um, it is from Africa and it can grow as a perennial there in areas where they don't get the winters and the freezes like we have. Um, they actually harvest it for grain. Um, and I believe it's called injera is what they use the grain to make. Um, so it's kind of cool um, to know that history behind it. It's relatively new here in the US um, and the seed is very, very small and usually coated. Um, and so I put a fun fact down here. There is 1,250,000 seeds per pound. Um, that is a lot. So a consideration with TEF when you're planting it if you have an older planter that maybe has, you know, a hole here or there where it has rusted, you have to consider that those seeds are so small that you're going to be losing some um, through those um, small holes in the cedar. So there's multiple harvests possible and um, multiple uses. So some people like it for horses now. Um, you really need to harvest it at the right time to get good quality. Um, or better quality, but it will never be something that you would want to feed um, lactating dairy cattle with. And so I have, let me see. I believe it's 70 days. Oh, here. Can be harvested within 60 days of seeding. So this would be a great emergency forage um, in case, you know, maybe you had a spring planting fail or you couldn't um, get in to plant in the spring. So the, the summer of 2019 when it rained a lot, if we need an emergency feed resource, um, this is one that we could get in the ground and get, you know, a couple harvest off as that emergency feed um, just to have something so that we make sure we can make it through the winter with a feed resource. Um, yes, Dr. Johnson, we mentioned um, 
Did we mention? Yes, I think so. You don't want to buy seed there where it says variety not stated is what he put in the chat. So um, what that means is um, it says you're buying alfalfa, but you don't know what variety. And so you don't know the disease resistance. You don't know if it has insect resistance. And it's just really a lot of unknowns. It could be multiple varieties, good and bad in there. Um, so we recommend not buying anything where you don't know what variety you're getting. Um, forage turnips uh, are a member of the brassica genus. So it's an annual forb and it has a high net energy. So it really would do better in a mix because um, it could be a little bit too high for some animals. A um, little bit like eating ice cream for every meal. It's not good for us. Um, not as good for the animals. So it's good um, to mix in with oats or um, like rye, for example. And it's tolerant of frost, but not of a freeze. So if you have some frost in the fall, you know, it'll be fine to keep grazing, but once it freezes, those plants will stop growing. Um, the best use is by grazing and they will reach down and pull, um, you know, the turnip and everything out of the ground and eat the whole thing. So um, they do, the cattle um, especially like it. I haven't seen um, sheep graze. Alicia, have you grazed sheep on turnips? Do they like them? Yeah, good. Um, so there we go, confirmed. Sheep and cattle both enjoy um, the foraged turnips. One thing to note is to avoid purple top. Um, you want to get a good forage variety of turnips um, for your um, seeding. So stand loss will occur each time you graze. It doesn't come back as well, say the sorghum Sudan grass, because when they eat it and pull that whole root out of the ground, there's, I mean, there's nothing left to keep going. So um, we do have to take that into consideration. If you want to graze that over a longer period of time, turnips will not um, stay there. And so final considerations for alternative forage is, um, can you fit it into a cropping system or into your rotation system? Will it fit on your farm? Do you talk with the neighbor and see if there's a window, if they're harvesting wheat and not um, doing anything out in that field um, until they plant again in the fall? Could you work together to keep the soil covered and give both of you a mutual benefit of planning something during that time? Um, will the feed quality meet your animal need? Um, you know, if you're in need of an emergency feed resource and you have a dairy cattle farm, TEF is probably not what you want to plant. It's definitely not what you want to plant. So you know, make sure that your animal needs and what you're planning and how um, you're using those alternative forages will help move your um, production forward. And then, like I said, consider the relationship that you can make with, um, you know, maybe the grain producer next door if there's land that um, maybe a cover crop could be put on and cattle graze it um, in the late fall into early winter. Um, just to see, you never know until you ask what kind of relationships could fit in there. And then, you know, the cattle manure and everything helps add organic matter and stuff back into that soil as well. So I'll take any of your questions now. Um, you can see this picture is actually from my trip in Africa and um, they were letting the sheep out to graze for the day and um, not as good a selection of forages there as we have here in Indiana. So I'm very thankful for, you know, the cool season grasses that we can grow and the high quality forages that we have available um, to purchase and to plant here. I see the earliest you would see Tef. I'm going to go to my forage field guide. And it says seeding dates are May 20 to July 15. So Brooke, the biggest thing with TEF isn't really date wise. It's going to be soil temperature wise. Um, it's very sensitive to colder temperatures. So you want it to be at least 65 degrees in that soil before that seed goes in the ground. So if you're in northern Indiana, be more careful because you don't warm you won't warm up as fast as down here. Yeah. Any other questions on anything? Yeah, 
Yeah, I do. Um, as a person goes about um, trying to select somebody to work with to purchase seed, um, how do you go about really finding if they have great seed to sell or not um, in terms of the types that they have, uh, their knowledge base? Uh, what would you do, Brooke, in terms of trying to find somebody that could be helpful to, let's say, especially first time buyers? Yeah, so um, I was first time buyer for my seed this year. So um, look for companies that specialize in forage seeds. Um, so I know there's several in Indiana um, to mention some. Cisco, I think, um, is it Baron Seeds? Is that right? Baron Baron. Um, Baron Brug, yep. So there's a couple different, if you um, just Google Indiana Forage Seed Dealers, um, you'll get those companies that come up. You can look at their varieties that they have available on their website. That's what I did. I looked on the different fact sheets to see, you know, what I may be interested in. So for example, I would, you know, potato leaf hopper resistant alfalfa seed and see, um, you know, what the different companies had available and compare them. You know, maybe the disease package on one versus the other is a little bit better. You can look at those percentages for what they're rated. Um, and so actually what I did was I contacted the seed place that I wanted to buy from. I just contacted them directly because I wasn't sure if my local cooperative was a dealer or anything or where to buy that brand of seed. And so um, what they did was they told me, okay, we know that this person usually gets seed from us. So we can have, if you call them, then order the seed from them. We deliver it to them and then you buy it from them. I could not buy it directly from the company. Um, if you have a big enough order, you can, but for small orders, it is a little bit harder. I was, I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit, dis, um, uh, I was kind of like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get seeds? It seems like, like I don't need to buy enough. I'm not going to get seeds. So how do I go about, so it was a little bit of a challenge um, to finally get connected to that local place where I could get the improved seed. Otherwise, if I you know, would have given up, I probably, you know, would have had to go with a lower quality seed, which isn't necessarily ideal. So I think, you know, to be totally transparent about there could be, it could take a little bit of extra work and energy on your half to get to that better final product if you are a smaller producer. I think serviceability of is very important too. So you've got somebody at least within the region you can call uh, not only for the sailing part of good quality seed, but if you happen to have some issues and, uh, you know, you want people that know the different varieties and species. And I think just having a conversation will let you quickly find out if uh, they, you know, have deer in the headlights look or whether they truly understand and can be helpful to you and your selection of quality, quality seed. Yes. Um, so I think, yeah, just calling and seeing what they have available, asking them if it is an improved variety. Um, it kind of seems like maybe they don't always keep those in stock. So it may be something that you have to order and um, get, but I think it definitely is worth spending that extra time and a little bit extra money to get those improved varieties versus the ease of just going to buy what's off the shelf of what they already stock because it's probably not not the improved varieties that will that higher yield or higher resistance to disease and insects. I would also say uh, purchase early. Let this be a uh, early winter activity that you make your selection because many times what happens, particularly with the warm season grasses, alternative forages are if you don't get them early sometimes and you're late to the phone or the request, you may not have them available for your seating. 
Yeah, I think in the last couple of years, it seems like that seat has been less available, um, even more so than normal. So only being on top of that this year. Um, get your call in, calls in now if you haven't already. Start working on that. So. All right, Alicia, I think that's all. All right, well, thank you so much, Brooke, for sharing your knowledge today. So if you guys wouldn't mind, I do have a quick little poll um, just to see see about this presentation. So if you could do that for me real quick, that would be great. And once I get the transcript done, um, I will upload it to that YouTube channel that I'd sent out with the email this week. Um, but I'll send that email or that link to the YouTube channel again um, in the link or in the email that will be sent out early next week again. So. Thank you again, Brooke, and I hope you guys all have a wonderful weekend. Yeah, thanks. Have a good Friday, everyone. <laughs>